No. All right, looks like the old problem came up again. Let me try to fix the connection issue. All right, looks like I cannot address today's connection issue. So I'll try one more time. If I can't address it in the next minute, so we go old old fashioned way, use a chalk and board. I can handle that too. Let me grab another computer to see if it's the issue of the cable or my uh, on my computer. Okay, be right back. I will also grab a cable.
All right, I think I need an IT guy. We tried a new computer, a new cable, none of them work. If any of you have some good idea, looks like it's flashing so some connection is It's it's doing something, right? New cable. I think we tried all kind of combination. New computer, new adapter. That's better call the IT person. So let's don't let this um, small incidents impact our today's lecture. Let's turn it off. Okay, perfect. Nice. Is the raised in the back? Okay, perfect. I actually, me personally, I excited to return to the board. I taught for first the two semester with everything on board, and I enjoy it more than anything else. So. <laughs> Let's do that. This can be my little notes. So, despite the little bit of interruption, morning everybody. Today's lecture gonna be continue the exciting journeys on chain confirmation. So, we discussed a couple easy cases, starting from all kind of these idealized chain model to look at size. And then we look at the rigidity, which is, we define a parameter called the persistence length. Use that to understand how rigid these polymers are. So what else is missing are two things. First is to understand how to describe the polymer coil as a whole and what experimental technique we can measure. End-to-end -end distance is something that easy to visualize and easy to discuss on the vac uh, using the vector, but it's actually a little bit challenging to measure experimental-wise. Um, so we, we're gonna talk a little bit about today what is the, a new parameter called the radius of gyration and how we can use radius of gyration to describe the size scale of your polymer coil, okay? So why we throw away everything we talked about end-to-end -end distance and this uh, adopt a new parameter. So first, we never throw that away. I'll show today. Those two parameters are linked. So if you know the end-to-end -end distance, or if you know the radius gyration, those two parameters can be easily convert one to another. It's just to need a factor of uh, root squared by six, um, a constant. You know, that's roughly about 2.3 uh, or 4, something like that. So if you know one parameter, you can convert to that. So RG is slightly smaller. We will explain what the radius or gyrations are. Um, so RG can be directly measured by experimental techniques, notably by a technique called uh, scattering. So scattering means when you shoot a magnetic wave into your polymer coil, you can bend the light and look at how what angle you bend light, you can calculate what's the size scale, okay? So I will not cover too much about the measurement of RG. My colleague, Dr. Jung Simon, will cover it next semester. So in part two of the polymer, he will teach you guys about using static light scattering and dynamic light scattering to measure RG and RH, which is hydro radius dynam uh, hydrodynamic radius, okay? Those two parameters are measurable, which means you can, you can measure what's RG. The other part of what we're gonna talk about RG today, not RE, is because RG is also widely used in GPC technique. So radius of gyration is being used as one of the detector in the GPC, as you know, you can use Spectroscopy, UV vis, you can use basically uh, viscometry to measure the molecular weight. 
and you can use um, scattering. So a very modern UV, uh, GPC will use the light scattering as a detector to measure what kind of molecular is eluded and how, far, how long and how much time it takes to reach there, okay? So that's part one. We're going to talk about what is RG is and why we need RG and how do we link it to end-to-end -end distance, REE, okay? And a lot of time when we measure, mention REE, this is going to be average square because we want to know averaged REE. So let's talk a little bit about that. I will try to use the 30 minutes to discuss what is radius of gyration and how do we understand RG and how polymers RG is related to IEE. Okay. So now think about a random polymer coil. So this is, a, again, the Gaussian coil we mentioned. First, I want to clarify what is the relationship between, let's say, you have roughly a dimension of R from the center to the outermost of the chain as R. And this R doesn't have any physical meaning, doesn't have any relation to RE and RG today, but I want to list it out so you can get a, some idea what is how does RG, RE, and relate to this radius, something that we can capture and understand in real life. So RG will be smaller than this radius. So roughly, RG represents a dot the circle, occupy a much smaller. RG will be defined just in a moment, mathematically, and defined as a physical meaning. So we're going to just uh, show you first physical, how, how should I interpret this, OK? Second is I want to I want discuss the conclusion. So RG square average will be 1 6 of REE square, OK? So that's another. Um, factors come into play, and we will talk about why there is a factor of six in, in, the, in, the, in this lecture particularly. So in other words, REE, the reason we don't do measurement of this is we don't have a ruler or microscope is so powerful yet to look at, hey, I know where the end of this coil is. Let me grab this one. I can see at atomic resolution, I can find a distance and find another one, measure the distance of it. And I need to do repeatedly for a polymer in solution because different conformation will show a different REE, it will show a distribution. So average REE is quite hard to measure directly, but indirectly you can do scattering, get RG, then you can show what the REE value is. So basically you're measuring the similar parameter shows you what's the dimension of a given polymer coil. That's how we measure them. And that ties into all the things we talked about in this lecture confirmation. You can do experimental ways to verify what's the theory we talk about, like free joint chain, how your end-to-end -end distance scale with, let's say, molecular weight or end-to-end -end distance, right? So we learn about that. Our end-to-end -end distance, let's just take average, no square, will be proportional to n l, n power of half, right? So in this way, you can actually do experiment to confirm it. And some of the homework, which I will talk later, we have a little bit of homework. People can measure this. So I can make a polymer that is one with increasing molecular weight. Let's say 1 kDa, 5 kDa, 10, so on and so forth. Then I can get, get increase. I can put this polymer into measurement. I can measure molecular weight. So this will be your molecular weight axis. You can measure a 1 kDa, 5. 
so on and so forth. So you can measure this Rg or Ree. They are basically proportional, right? So you can measure. You typically need to plot log scale to get the value. So you can look at this and measure the slope. This will be your, your scale value. You can confirm if it's one half or not. Okay. Experimentally, now you have a way to link either log Rg or log Ree. Some of the homework will cover this aspect. That's, that's the usefulness of this. Why we, need a, uh, why we need to use Rg instead of Ie to measure our results. So how do we get radius of gyration? So let's show one, one more time. Just a pretty random polymer coil. This will be the end-to-end -end distance from bond L I, L L1, L2, L3, so on and so forth. Four, five, six. So that's your bond vector as we talked about. Right? So the radius of gyration basically defines a hypothetical center of this point. And what is the average distance to the mass center to each point of the bond? So there is a f definition of that. So Rg squared will be defined as I divided by N. N is this parameter is a mass of the body. So basically how heavy your bodies are. And I defined as moment of inertia. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more what the top part means, OK? This i is basically going to be equals to integrate of its mass and to the vector. And m is just going to be integrate of its mass, OK? So. How do we define this Ri? Remember, this is not the bond anymore. So Ri defines, if I take an average of the mass center, mass center means I take average where the center <coughs> of the mass, you can balance it. Some people see other people could balance a rock or a piece of paper. Basically, they need a, a point there, for example, if I can balance my chalk, I need to balance it right the gravity center. So imagine this is where the center of the mass for this molecular chain. Li defines with the bond from your atom to the second. This particular parameter, Ri, defines B generally the center of the mass pointing to any your bond, OK? Any of origin of your bond. So this will be defined as Ri, R1, and so on and so forth. You can have R2 here, R3. So moment of inertia is basically tell you if I use a mass multiplied by this R square, it's basically, you can think about how much Mass is being imposed on your material. Or the longer the distance, the higher we need to count this moment of inertia. OK? Think about road, rotation, et cetera, rotation of tire. Or the heavier your tire is, the longer distance it's from the axis, the harder to rotate. And the RG, then the bottom part, you basically need just to sum of all the mass of your material. So now if you think about me in terms of Rg, we need to count 
how heavy my finger is, how heavy my arm is, and understand how it further, what's the distance from the center of my body. If you know, if you uh, if assume a uniform density from the top to bottom, and you know the shape of me, you can calculate RG of the Dr. Ku using this very simple equation. Okay, you need to integrate where how far my part of body to the center and use this simple equation. Not too hard. We will explain a little bit more detail how we can convert this particular equation and link what is R E E average to R G. these two parameters. There, if you look at this, they may look, have no link. This is a coming from the center, and usually this dot is not in the polymer chain, because it's basically a three-dimensional coil, and the center of it, it might be full onto your polymer chain, but there's a fairly good chance it's not sitting on the polymer chain. However, if you look at this, R1 and R2, is linked to L1, right? So this will be R1, this will be R2. What's the relationship? So if you look at R2 plus, uh, R1 plus L1 equals to L2. So in this case, if you apply this relationship, you can basically connect Later on, in more detail, how does the vector on the bond to the vector, uh, uh, so this is vector outside the bond to vector on the bond. They are related just because of this triangle relationship. Okay? Any questions so far? What we're doing here is trying to link the bond vectors to the center of mass vector to each portion of the bond, okay? So, the simple way to understand that RG is here, if you look at this particular definition, so this is a definition, not equation. So RG is always defined by inertia moment, um, moment of inertia divided by its mass. So for a given structure, we just need to understand how RG is relevant to MI, RI square, divided by NI, integration. Okay. So, a simple way to understand is the integration MI is a constant. If our molecule, each bond has a given molecular weight is the same, so we can take this portion out and without need to consider that. So it will be mi sum of ri squared divided by in the bottom. This will give us number of the bond, and each bond we has a mass of ni. Okay. So Rg squared is basically going to be equals to 1 divided by n. We need to sum up basically i to 1 to n and r, small r, i, average. Okay. We basically need to understand what is the average distance from all these bond vectors, from the center of the mass to each part, and take a square and take an average of it. So if we think about a ball, that, that's the most easiest example. And we, we should be able to have some time either talk about this later part of this class or the next one. You just need to give you a little bit of detailed example to visualize what this, this particular parameter means. Average of 
R i square. Add them all together and take an average of n. OK? I'm going to add this R1 square, add R2 square, add R3 square, R4, R5, R6, R7, then divide by 7. This will give you Rg square. So this will be bigger, this smaller, longer. So if you think about take an average, roughly, this may be somewhere here, right? That agrees with what this kind of part of the picture gives you. The Rg will not be as big as here, right? Because those bonds are shorter than there. When we, once we average them out, this will be a smaller circle than the longest bond. This one I want to point, point out clearly so everybody understand what this particular size scale. OK? So now, let me give you a few examples of what RG value is for a given cases. So we talked about polymer coil. The Rg square will be 1 6 of n to n distance. So if we have a Gaussian coil, we know Re will be n L square divided by 6, right? Re square. Idealize the chain n L square. That's the n to n distance divided by 6. So. Using the example we talked about in the early days when we discussed about the polyethylene coil, we know about 280K is about 30 nanometer in end-to-end -end distance. So RG in that case, you need to calculate it. So if you divide the end-to-end -end is RG. Remember, there is a square term here. RG will be equals to root square uh, e value, OK? So this um, will be smaller than IE roughly by a factor of 2.4, something like that, OK? It's smaller. So in terms of 280K polyethylene, your value will be roughly about 10 and uh, radius of gyration versus end-to-end -end distance, roughly about 30, OK? So the other few objects that everybody know is, uh, let's talk about sphere. This is a simple one, as I mentioned. If we have a center of the sphere has a radius of r, let me tell you that the conclusion for a solid-state sphere Rg will be equals to okay. So this is also in the lab notebook, um, in the lecture note. You, if you you look at the note, we also give you a bunch of detail list. Also the thin rods. If we have a rods, has a lens from here to here. Is length is L, Rg will be equals to L divided by root square of 12. Let's use um, one example to talk about solid sphere. Why in this case it is? Five thirds. Solid sphere is relatively easy to understand, right? Because we got uniform density, and we know this particular term quite easy. We just need. Uh, let me use this space to explain.
So for in the case of Sophia, we just uh, need to understand what, how do we approach this value. So we just need to integrate the value from the r, 0, from the origin of it to all the way to the edge of it, which is r. And mass will be defined as density, right? Multiplied by 4 pi r squared. multiplied by so in the in the mass in the bottom of the term we just need to integrate <laughs> so the density actually comes here there is also a density term. Three. Uh, okay, so this would be r so three fourths pi r squared. That would be the the total amount of the weight or the mass of the given the sphere. So the density that's the volume. Okay, so if you do this integration, you will be able to get the Rg square will be, so this, when we integrate this, this will be 3, 4, pi. Right? Wait a second. There's something not defined right here. Let me check one more time. The top is correct. We need average distance from the Center. Yeah, it it says we're off a little bit. I'm wondering where the arrow. Oh, I see. So this will be. The bottom part will be equal to four pi r square. Uh, that's defined as the mass, the volume. With a dr, so this the top, right? R, dr and multiply by r. So in this way, we can reach the distance. In the first part, we just need to consider every single tiny part of the Cauchy structure, the sphere. What's the distance to the center? That's basically defined in that case. In this way. The top parts, when we integrate, this is going to be this basically means it's going to be r square, apply value of r and apply value of zero. So this will be r square minus zero. Okay, the top. The, the bottom of that will be integrate. This is r to the power of force. OK, so there's 2r. That means it's going to be equals to 4 thirds 
um, multiplied by Okay, so this will be also going from 0 to r. If you apply the value of r to here, this basically simplifies it to be exactly this value. So if you now take 5, 4 cancels with each other. Okay, so looks like there are, uh, we need to reverse this again. I write incorrectly the top and bottom. So this should be on the top. Then you have 5 thirds of r squared. So when you consider all these, this is a simple way to understand what the radius gyration for a sphere. So in the polymer coil, this is slightly more complex because the triangle relationship, what we talked about, need to have a conversion. Okay, so I'll, I'll use the next lectures to talk about the conversion between a, sphere, uh, a square from L to R and how to link these two together, okay? Um, the other part that importance of RG is for different polymer, the radius of gyration is more important than persistence lens. For a given polymer, it's less common to measure persistence lens. The RG is more useful. Um, there's a couple importance of RG. When you know the radius of gyration, you know when you, de uh, when you start to dissolve the polymer, basically you would form an individual coil. RG is an important parameter to understand if your polymer is going from a dilute solution to more concentrated solution, okay? So if we're a single coil, if we're another coil, you can consider the overlapping concentration. What this parameter C, overlapping concentration, defines is when you have a coil going to start to touch it. If you start to increase the dissolved concentration, you basically add another coil. But keep increasing this, you're going to start to look at when does the um, polymer start to touch each other. Okay? This is a defined by um, C, overlapping concentration. So this defines as what, when the concentration within a given coil is the same as the concentration of the polymer. So you need the mass divided by volume to get this particular concentration. So the mass in here is defined by how much you had in given coil. So typically, we need to know how does this mass inversely proportional to the volume. And this volume is basically is proportional to Rg, power of thirds, right? And mass is proportional to N, or number of the bonds will be N or molecular weight. So if we know the Rg, is, again, I'm going to use a proportional term. For all our polymer, we scale with n one-thirds L cubicle. And the top is scale with 1. So we will see the results will show n power of 1, n power of 2 thirds, L power of thirds. So this shows overlapping concentration will be dependence of power of this n is molecular weight inverse of two uh, a half 
okay? So if you have overlapping concentration, if you increase the molecular weight, or n, this will inversely scale with the value as shown here. So that's a, a useful thing to understand what's the overlapping concentration and how does overlapping concentration be relevant to the radius of gyration. In the next part of the lecture, in the polymer solution, we will start to discuss about what is the concentration and how does the polymer uh, uh, how does polymer interact with solvent to talk about Flory Huggins parameter? The other importance of radius of gyration is basically to understand how your polymer size scale of your polymer. RG, as I mentioned, is a direct way to measure how big, how small. So that has been used to use widely in the GPC. If you think about how GPC measures the molecular weight, it basically uses light scattering to measure the RG. And since RG is proportional to degree of polymerization N, you can use that to measure that. Okay? Although not directly, a lot of time, you also combine with the colon, so you can use illusion volume to back calculate what's the molecular weight in these. But typically, they are combined together. You could also do a steady light scattering. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still in the lab class you guys do. So if you have that courses, the li uh, light scattering combined with thin plot is a very common way people to measure the molecular weight. Okay, so we will uh, we will not cover too much detail there. That will be covered in the next course to how to measure the molecular weight using the zinc plot based on the, um, the RG information, et cetera, okay? So the other part that I want to quickly cover is um, a one-like chain model. In the last lecture, we left it with the one-like chain model. We didn't finish every single bit of it. We mentioned a one-like chain model is a very important model bridges the link between a regular polymer versus uh, you know, flexible with a rod. So let's revisit to that minor topic again to understand how we use a one-like chain model. So we have discussed a few occasions. You have a flexible coil. You have a semi-rigid chain, and you have very rigid chain. So uh, something interesting is how they scale relative to each other. So let's consider contour lens. If everybody still remember, contour lens um, is a parameter that defines how big these chains are. Contour lens, in this case, will be NL, NL, and NL. So they will be the same. But now let's look at REE square. This will be now be different, right? This one scale with NL square, which we know. We have talked about in the free joint chain model. This one we're going to cover today in the later part, which we don't know. And this end-to-end -end distance is quite simple. N L square, N square, L square. So if you look at this, there is an interesting relationship happening is the size scale of the N distance proportional to this um, N of power of one. This is N square. So you can naturally think in the middle, we will have something just a right between one and the two, which is the case how we want to use a one-like chain model to capture that, okay? So this particular one-like chain model has the ability to bridge these two extreme cases. So in the, in the figure that we actually showed in the slides, it showed you what it, it, it showed you a nice plot, in particular this. 
let me show you here. I'm trying to reproduce this complex figure. So end-to-end -end distance, or in this figure, they specifically use the h squared. That's basically the same as IE. And they're plotting a log scale, OK? So in the raw-like case, and this will be L divided by LP. L is the length of the molecular. So in, the, in other words, if you look at here, the end-to-end -end distance log would depend on this by a slope of 2. So in this case, remember this is a log scale. Let's also use a log scale here. In the raw limit, the length of your molecule or the end-to-end -end distance scale with L is the length in one direction. Divide by LP is scale going to be by a factor of 2. In the other extreme, so in the one-like chain, basically we're going to have a transition from 2 to value of 1 in terms of slope. This where is a flexible core. In this case, it's scale with n power of 1. And this is where a generalized relationship is given. I'm going to write the long equation here, OK? Equals 2 LC multiplied by LP. OK? LC is a contour length. LP is a persistence length. If you know how long, how long the, um, the molecule total are, how rigid these are, you can get the first portion of the equation, minus 2 LP square okay so this is the second portion of description how this relate you need to combine these two parts to understand it there is two extreme cases where um we can get LP and LC relationship. So L contour lens LC we know is equals to NL. LP, we also know the value, right? LP would be equals to infi C infinity half um, L. So the first portion is basically relevant to what we're going to show is to C infinity and L square. So if you apply those two terms within this particular equation, this first portion is basically C infinity and L square, right? If you add in there, this half is divided by this number two. So this two cancels out each other. Um, then all you left is C infinity and L square. So this is exactly as we described in the flexible chain. Why you would have, in what scenario we, you can drop of this, is in the case when LC contour lens is much bigger than LP. Remember, we had a definition for this. When your contour lens, how long your polymer chain? Is, mu is much, much bigger than LP. This is, means you are very flexible. So how does this one-like chain model can capture that? If we have LC is much bigger than LP, this particular portion means it's going to be a very large constant, right? This is now going to be 1,000 or million. If you think about LC as a million times of LP which satisfy this flexible bond model. So EXP, inverse proportional of LCLP, when LC is much bigger than LP, this basically equals to 1. OK? Why? Because EXP minus infinity will be closer to 1. 
Okay, if we apply 1 to this equation, 1 minus 1 is 0. So in the case of flexible bond limit, we can drop of the second term and only consider the first portion of, which is a flexible bond limit. Okay? And then, of course, there's another extreme when you consider LC much smaller than LP. What that means? Your persistence lens is much bigger than your polymer's case, then it will go to the other extreme. This will be the raw like. So one like chain can also predict the raw like. This is actually part, part of the homework. So I'll leave the second part, but simply allude to the homework is you need to apply this again back to that equation to get the other part of the extreme. When you have LP is much bigger than LC. Okay? So in a, in a nutshell, this one action model is quite unique. It does a great job to bridge this region. So this equation captures anything in between. We talked about in one extreme, the equation can be simplified to be flexible bond model with a, with a, a length dependence of power of one. In the other extreme, you can have the rod that has dependence of L square depend on the length scale of square. So combining those two, the one like chain model is quite useful to describe any polymer is not rigid as DNA, but not as soft as flexible chain, such as polyethylene, etc. So what are these polymers look like? So if you go back to the Tinglogist textbook, they give a few great examples, such as PET polymer, such as a lot of polymer that my research group deal with, semiconducting polymer, which has aromatic backbones, those are, bonds are rigid, so they cannot be very flexible, so they fit into this one like chain model region, okay? Right in here. Any question for this particular one like chain model? It's basically a universal model that captures raw to flexible cylinder. Any question? If not, then um, we have, uh, I think that that is pretty good uh, capture of what is uh, flexible, semi-flexible chains using the benefit of the LP persistence lens and contour lens to describe its dimension. So combining all together using the flexible model, using the rotation model, all these models are coming to one drawback that I haven't talked about too much about is, again, they still fit into the idealized chain. So no interaction between different bonds. That's why um, you always neglect the solvent effect. So in the real, real working chain, we're going to come back to that topic in the later part of the caution, portion of the class. So we're going to talk about why in the real, real chain model, this um, RG, even today's discussion, we know RG will be still proportional N of 0.5 L. This means proportional, right? Same as IE. IE is also proportional. They are just missed by a constant C in front of it, the difference. But in the real chain, all the polymer will be slightly swell. So RG, what we measure in real polymer chain, will be deviating, and it will be proportional to N of this. So again, using this curve I talked about, we make new polymer, we measure them. In real case, your data will be slightly higher slope. This slope is going to be 0 0.6 due to the preferential swallowing of the solvent to a partner, okay? When you make different molecular way when you measure it. So um, I would like to wrap today's lecture. So we will have a homework again. 
it's announced in the Canvas. If you go there, we have about four or five questions on the Canvas. If you don't have access to it, let me know. Otherwise, um, I'm looking forward to hear back the homeworks in next Thursday. And next Tuesday, we're going to have a pause for the course. We're going to uh, go through the homework. I'm going to grade them and return next Tuesday. We're going to talk about the homework and the survey together in the classroom. And I also leave sometimes for question and answer. If you have any Q&As for what we talked about so far, uh, we can also address those comments and questions. OK, any other questions, class? If not, then let's finish today's lecture. And um, let me also figure out a way to address this long-term problem, the project issue. <laughs>